What's going on guys, my name is Matt and inside of this very unassuming pre-built case is not only the best sleeper PC I've ever built, but believe it or not, this is the first system I've ever custom water cooled. This was a lot of work to pull off and I'm really happy with how this PC turned out. For this project, I had to do some custom mounts for parts, solder wires, cut acrylic, bend tubes, and do a number of other things to get the system to the state you're seeing it in, and I'm super excited to share the process with you. Also, this PC is basically two modes, you can either have all the lights turned off with the original side panel on for full stealth mode, or I made a magnetic side panel to show off the internals for when you want to be a little more flashy. This is because, in my opinion, there's not much point of building a system this pretty if you're never going to actually see it. I want to give a big shout out to Corsair for helping out with this project. They didn't pay me, but they provided a ton of parts for this system, and without their support, this video wouldn't have been possible. Also, there will be a second part of this video released in a few weeks talking about overclocking, gaming slash workstation performance and some other things. This video you're watching right now is going to talk about the process of making the system and talk about the parts in it. For those who haven't heard of the concept of a sleeper PC, it's basically a computer that looks somewhat boring and mundane from the outside, but it's top of the line specs on the inside. This trend is inspired by sleeper cars which follow the same model of looking slow from the outside but having a lot of power under the hood. Most sleeper PC builds usually start with selecting the case, usually they're very old beige boxes and I've done one of these myself, but I picked the case I did for a number of reasons. First off, I love the way it looks. It's simple, but in a good way. This style of Lenovo slash IBM cases is by far my favorite design of pre-builds, and while it does look nice, at a quick glance not many people would assume this is a powerful system. To be more specific, the chassis is for a Lenovo S30 workstation PC from nearly a decade ago. I used the original system in an older project and held onto it because I knew one day I would build a new system inside of it. I also like this case because it's got a ton of openings for airflow, and it's a full-size ATX machine so there was hopefully going to be enough room for custom water cooling. The first step in the modding process was to tear the existing PC down to make room for the new parts. The old system in this is still pretty decent being an older Xeon system and I already transferred all those parts into a new case so they wouldn't go to waste. Being a workstation the system had a lot of nice features like the power supply which was 80 plus gold rated. Pulling all the parts out didn't take very long at all. First I pulled out the power supply then the motherboard and finally I took out all the front panel stuff like the I.O., the disk drive, and the power button. With this done, the case was ready to start being modified. To make as much room as possible, I need to remove all the front drive mounts. I began by drilling out all the rivets I could find that were holding the drive cages in. Sadly, there were some mounting points on the back panel which were non-accessible, so I had to go at it with a crowbar and pry the cage from the case. Finally, I gave it a few wax with a mallet and it all came out in one piece. Something I noticed was that a rivet was missing towards the bottom front of the chassis, so I simply drilled the hole a little bigger, inserted a rivet, and used the rivet tool to secure it in place. With the drive cages out, I could now start figuring out how I was going to install each component. I did some measurements of the case to figure out what size radiator would be able to fit. Then I headed over to the Corsair HydroX configurator. This allows you to input the components you're going to be using and it gives you a full list of what you need to water cool those parts. This was super helpful for a noob like me because without it I'm sure I would have forgotten something. Now this kind of gives you the minimum of what you need so getting stuff like extra fittings isn't a bad idea. Once once all the components arrived to me, I was able to start physically seeing how they were going to fit in the case. I was most worried about the radiator, but with a quick check, it was clear it was possible to make it work. With the reassurance the radiator would fit, I could begin preparing the parts for water cooling. I needed to install water blocks, fittings, and tubing, but before all that, I needed to ensure all the parts were working, building the system, and filling the loop only to find out I had a dead CPU or motherboard would have been a giant pain in the butt. Testing the parts was simple, I installed the CPU into the socket, installed the stock cooler, plugged in my RAM, a graphics card, and a few PSU cables. Turning on the system, I found it booted right up and went into the BIOS where I could confirm everything was recognized. With this done, I could now start the water cooling process. First thing I decided to do was install the water blocks on the CPU and graphics card. The CPU was first and was very simple to install. This is the XC7 RGB which has mounting hardware for LGA 1150X and AM4 CPUs. I installed the AM4 bracket onto the block, put the backplate under the motherboard, 
lowered down the block and screwed in four screws. That's it, super simple, you don't even need to worry about thermal paste because it comes pre-applied. Moving on to the GPU block is where it got a little more complex. I needed to tear down my graphics card which has an Nvidia Founders Edition cooler. Now normally you'd need to unscrew a few screws and you'd have access to the card's PCB, but Nvidia being Nvidia, they made it so I need to unscrew over 30 screws to access the PCB. Once all the screws were removed, I could open up the card and take off the leftover thermal pads, placing them back in their original spots on the cooler, and I could clean off the GPU die itself. The Corsair XG7 water block not only had pre-applied thermal paste, but also had thermal pads pre-installed, which you don't usually see, and made the process a bit easier. I lowered the card onto the block and the backplate onto the card and secured it with about a dozen screws. Now both water blocks were installed and I could bring my attention to the other water and cooling parts. I wanted to mount the radiator in first before everything else because that was going to require the most modifications to make it fit. This is the Corsair XR5 360 which is a high quality copper 360mm radiator. I decided to use a few pieces of aluminum as a guide for mounting this and as a spacer to make sure the chassis itself wouldn't interfere with the front fan spinning. I marked spots that corresponded with all the mounting holes for the radiator, then drilled them out one by one. This left me with basically a template for marking the case itself, and I used a 120mm fan to keep each of the pieces square and spaced correctly. I put this into the case and started marking holes where the rad would mount. I found that not all the points would be able to secure to the front, but enough wood to keep it nice and secure. I drilled out all these marked holes, making sure they would be wide enough for the screws I was going to be using. With this done, I put just the radiator itself in to make sure all the holes lined up, and luckily they did. I next installed one of the fans and the bracket with a few screws to the radiator to hold everything in place, then lined up the two other fans and lifted the whole thing to the front of the case. I went ahead and screwed it in and was happy to see my custom mount was working. I then installed the other three fans to the back of the radiator. These are to move as much air as possible through the sky for maximum cooling performance. With the radiator installed, I could now start putting in the other parts to figure out where the reservoir was going to mount. One problem I ran into was the fact the IO shield cutout on this case was smaller than a standard IO cutout which was annoying, but I found another solution for that later. So I popped the motherboard into place, then the GPU. I could then get out the pump res combo and figure out where I was going to mount it. This is the XD3 RGB which is Corsair's smaller form factor pump res combo which worked great because I honestly don't think I could have fit the full size one. I decided to mount it here because this was basically the only place it would fit without interfering with other components. I had to drill a few holes because the normal mounting methods wouldn't work with my weird configuration. I put the bracket on the reservoir and mounted it to the back of the case. With this done I could breathe a very momentary sigh of relief because everything fit and I could proceed with the project. Now came the scary part for me, installing tubing and fittings. There were three types of fittings I used, these basic compression fittings that attach tubes to the components like the water blocks, radiators, and reservoirs, these right angle fittings that extend the basic compression fittings, and finally these right angle fittings that connect two pipes together. To plan out a loop, the best thing to do, especially for a beginner like me, is to draw out how you are going to do your tube runs. Most of what I read online states that loop order doesn't matter, so I just went with connect that made the most sense from an ease of assembly and aesthetic perception. With the loop planned out, I could now start bending tubes. The only non hydrox part I used in the loop was the tubing. Corsair has rigid tubing, but it's made out of acrylic, which is generally harder to work with than PETG, and everyone I talked to recommended I use PETG, especially because this is my first time. Basically what you do is take a rough measurement of how long the tube run is going to be, use this tool to cut the tube by twisting it and slowly applying more pressure. Once cut, you deburr the edges. To actually bend the tubes, you need a lot of patience and practice. I was absolutely awful when I started and learned a lot throughout the process. Too much so to put in this video, but if you would like a dedicated what I learned water cooling my first PC video, then let me know in the comment section below. With the cut piece of tubing, you use the silicone insert with a bit of soap on it to make sure it doesn't get stuck 
insert it into the tube, and then use a heat gun to start warming up the area you're going to bend. Heating up the tubing was probably the most difficult part. Heating it up too much messes it up, heating it up too little messes it up, heating up too small of an area messes it up, and so on and so forth. Where it gets really complicated is multi-bend runs, which I didn't end up doing any of, but these require extreme precision. Once the bend was complete, I would hold the piece by the fitting and figure out how much I needed to trim off. I got this expensive but very much worth it rigid finishing bit which makes a very smooth edge and allows you to remove a millimeter of tube at a time to get the perfect length run. Again, I can't highly recommend this bit enough for PETG tubing. This along with everything else in the video will be linked in the description below. Next came repeating the process for all the other runs, measure, cut, bend, trim, and repeat. With all the runs done, I was able to use the fittings to install them and it was super satisfying installing all the pieces and to see the build really start to come together. My bends definitely aren't perfect, but for my first time, I'm content with how they look. Now it was time to leak test the loop. This was very nerve wracking as I had no idea if everything was installed correctly and if it would leak. To fill the system, you plug the pump into the power supply and nothing else. This allows only the pump to run and if it leaks on other components, it'll be fine because there won't be any power going to those components. I filled the loop with Corsair's XL5 clear coolant because while distilled water would work fine, using something like this prevents stuff like bacteria growth in the loop and is much better if you plan on running the system for months or years to come. I used this power supply jumper that came included with the pump res combo and the power supply switch to turn the pump on and off. Squeezing enough water into the res to fill it up, you just switch the pump on until it's almost empty, fill it up again, and repeat until the loop is full. Once full, I let it run for 24 hours to ensure there were no leaks. Again, this is to ensure components don't get wet and damaged by a leak. After 24 hours, I was happy to see a leak-free system. With that, the water cooling was done, but the build was far from over. Next came installing the power supply, which is something I definitely should have done before filling the loop. The system's very cramped, and I had to be very careful not to dislodge any tubes which could spill water everywhere. It was like playing a very expensive game of operation. With this in, I started to realize just how many cables there were. Between all the fan cables, RGB cables, power supply cables, and other miscellaneous ones, I knew there was no way to make these look neat enough if they stayed exposed, so I had to figure out a way to hide them. I'm sure you have heard of a power supply basement, but have you heard of a cable management basement? Basically, I made a cover that hides all the cables. I took angle aluminum, cut out six pieces to the size I needed, drilled holes and installed rivets. This made these two U-shaped pieces that would act like a frame for the shroud. For panels over the frame, I decided to use acrylic. I scored and snapped the two pieces I needed. These were glued onto the aluminum frame and left to dry overnight. To cover them, I used this carbon fiber look final. I cut a piece a little too big for the shroud. I applied it to the acrylic and tried to push out as many air bubbles as I could. Next, I trimmed off the excess final and was left with a completed cable management shroud. It is isn't perfect but all of it that is visible looks very nice. Also, I think this makes the build look much cooler and certainly is much nicer on the eyes than dozens of messy cables. With the cables hidden, the inside of the system was complete and it was now time to move on to the exterior. For the large holes left by the disk drive and card reader, I first removed the front pieces from the drives themselves. Using these will maintain the original look without having the bulk of an unnecessary disk drive and card reader that wouldn't have fit anyway. What I did was tape the pieces in place from the front using painter's tape. This kept them exactly where I wanted them. Then I flipped the cover over and applied glue to permanently attach the pieces into place. The CD drive looks fine, but the card reader you can see through the gaps where the cards would normally go. I need to figure out a solution in the future to make it look more natural. For the front I.O., I disassembled the front USB and audio to take a look at it. I was going to replace the USB 2 connectors with an extra USB 3 set I had, but neither the new USB or old USB cables were long enough to reach the header on the motherboard, and I didn't care that much about front USB, so I just installed the ports only into the original spots and kept the front audio as is. For the power button and LED, I needed to modify the existing cable to work with the new motherboard. What I did was snip the old connector and solder jumper cables to make the power switch and power LED leads work. This worked well and I'm happy I was able to make the original power button LED work for the system. Cutting a hole in the power button assembly allowed the front audio cable to pass through 
computer also. With this done, I took a step back and was seriously happy with how the system was turning out, but was disappointed I would never be able to see the internals. I wanted the original panel to work for full stealth mode, but I also wanted a window for when I wanted to see the loop and all the pretty RGB LEDs. So what I did was make my own DIY magnetic side panel. Now this method isn't new, I think I first saw it on a Caitlyn V3 video which I'll link below. Basically I took a sheet of clear acrylic, scored it on two edges, and snapped the excess off to be left with the size I needed. To mount it I used this cool magnet tape, I just cut down strips and applied it to the edges of the panel. This didn't look very good from the other side so I needed a way to hide the magnetic tape. I used the same vinyl from the cable shroud which I cut into a little over one inch strips. I measured one inch on the acrylic and applied each of the strips to make a pretty good looking border. I then just flipped it over and cut off the excess vinyl. With the window complete, it was now time to start the system up for the first time. Luckily, it booted up first try. Now, like I said before, performance testing plus a bunch of other stuff will be in part two of this video, but I do wanna go over each of the parts now before we wrap the video up. So let's start by talking about the CPU. What I went with is the Ryzen 9 3900X, which is probably the best price to performance workstation CPU on the market. It has 12 cores and 24 threads, which is perfect for stuff like intense video editing, but it still clocks pretty high, which also makes it great for gaming. At a little over $400, this isn't cheap, but going up to the 3950X for another $350 just didn't seem worth it. For the motherboard, I went with a pretty basic X570 board feature-wise, but in terms of performance, it rivals boards that are much more expensive. This is the ASUS Prime X570P, which at around $150 is a decent deal for the money. Again, it isn't super feature rich, but in a video from Hardware Unbox, Steve found this to be a top performer among entry level X570 boards. I was going to go with the ASUS Tough X570, but this was out of stock, so I went with this instead. I think it looks pretty decent overall, it has the features I needed, and I have no regrets picking up this board. For RAM, I went with 32GB of Corsair Vengeance RG. GB Pro memory clocked at 3600MHz. 3600MHz is a sweet spot for Ryzen based systems and 32GB is great for stuff like video editing but is very overkill for gaming. The lighting on these sticks look really nice and because this is Corsair RAM it integrates lighting wise with the rest of the system by using IQ. For storage I just went with the 1TB Intel 660p NVMe SSD in the M.2 form factor. This isn't the greatest NVMe drive but 1TB is a good starting point that can easily be upgraded upon in the future. Plus there's another M.2 slot so you have a number of different storage upgrade options. For the graphics card, I went with the most powerful card I own which is the RTX 2080 Super Founders Edition. This is one step below the mighty 2080 Ti performance wise but it still outputs amazing performance being able to play anything you throw at it with high resolutions and refresh rates. The combo of the 3900X and 2080 Super is great for a number of different tasks. For the power supply, I went with the Corsair RM750 which is a 750 watt 80 plus gold rated power supply. It's fully modular which is perfect for a build like this or any build where space is limited. Custom length cables would have been nice but the included ones weren't bad at all. This unit provides plenty of clean reliable power to the entire system and 750 watts is more than enough power. The case and all the water cooling stuff we went over earlier in the video but again everything will be linked in the description if you want to find out more details and current pricing. Overall this is the most powerful system I've ever built and is the first system I've ever custom water cooled. It's it's not perfect but I'm happy with how it turned out and hope you guys are too. If you have any questions or specific things you'd like to see or hear about in part 2 of this series then let me know your suggestions in the comment section below. So yeah guys I think this wraps this video up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did make sure to give this video a thumbs up and consider subscribing so you get notified when part 2 comes out. And as always this is Matt from Tech by Matt signing out.